My father-in-law uh, is a management consultant like me. It's where I learned the trade a little bit. And he re told me a story of one time in a class. They were it's with the class of, I don't know, 30 and 20-somethings. And he was asking them a type of an icebreaker question. Tell me something unique about yourself. And a 24-year-old 20, lady uh, said that she's already planned her entire funeral. Everything was picked out from the casket to the music that was going to be played. Uh, she even had the grave site already paid for. Um, and everyone in the class just kind of looked at her and and because they've worked with her and they're like, is there something we should know about you that you haven't told us? Like, do you have a terminal illness? Do you have days to live? Why? why? So she must have had some slick, slick salesman come along and sell her the whole package. Um, but I, I share that story because, you know, most 24-year-olds, they're not worried about dying. They're worried about living it up. Um, and they, they're not planning their funeral. They're not planning on where it's going to be and what's going to be said at the funeral, what music's going to be played. Do I own a gravesite yet to be buried into a casket? I mean, we don't typically do that. But I ask the question, have you planned your funeral yet? Have you planned your funeral yet. Many Christians haven't realized that they've already had their funeral, a spiritual funeral, that is. Go to Romans chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. It says this, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. But henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, old man isn't a local colloquialism when you're talking about your dad. Okay? He's, he might have been the old man growing up, but this old man is you. What does that mean? Well, it's the old you, uh, the old part of you that didn't know God, the part of you that was in need of being buried. And when God gave us his new life, that's exactly what happened. We read along in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It says this, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. So there's the crucifixion part. For Christians, we partake, we participate in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying to the Galatians, he's saying, listen, I want you to understand, on a spiritual level, you have already had your funeral. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I but Christ liveth in me. So it's not us living anymore, it's Christ in us. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Spiritually speaking, we indeed have participated in a funeral, our own funeral. But we need to heartfully attend our own funeral, to be an eyewitness of our own funeral, and become aware of its implications to our life right now. All right, so hopefully by the time we get done reading today's scriptures, you and I will have taken this spiritual journey to our own funeral. See why it's necessary that we attend it, see it with our own eyes, and then take some implications from our spiritual death to apply it to the here and now. Every movie that I've ever watched where someone dies in the movie and uh, they have this ghost experience where the soul leaves their body and it's hovering over their body and they're looking at themselves at the car accident or, or in the hospital bed or wherever it might be, and they're trying to get their relative's attention or their wife's attention or whoever's there and trying to get them to say, hey, I'm right here. Why won't you talk to me? And then some, some angel comes along and helps them understand, uh, you're dead now. That's why they are not talking to you. They can't hear you. They can't see you. And then they, of course, always have to put a hand through the body to, oh, my, how'd you do that? Well, let's go take a walk through the wall and, whoa, I can walk through walls. And so 
there's a period of time in several scenes at the beginning of those death movies where the person who's just passed away realizes that they're not in the earthly body that they once were. And because of that change, because of that death, there's now implications to the way that they're going to live their life now, right? And Paul is trying to tell us this as well. Paul is trying to tell you and I that we have spiritually died. And because we've spiritually died and been given new life in Jesus Christ, there's implications that we need to understand about our new life, how we operate, how we communicate, how we walk through walls, if you will, right? Because we've changed. We've changed. Um, and, and what I want to really talk about today is why Christianity hasn't attended their own funeral. Why we talk about other things. You know, we talk in, in Christianity, and many of us grew up, maybe you grew up in a Christian home, you probably heard parents talk about proper Christian behavior. Uh, usually when you weren't properly behaving, they'd say, that's not proper Christian behavior. That's not proper Christian language. So we like to talk about behavior. We like to talk about spiritual disciplines. You, well, have you prayed about it? Have you read your Bible? Um, et cetera, et cetera. When was the last time you went to church? Um, and self-improvement even. Okay, we love to, we love to take a, a modern psychology approach and talk about self-improvement behavior in Christianity as well. We cover all those things, we talk about all those things, but too often we don't discuss enough about the core message of salvation, which is death, and new life. We skip over that part. Death and new life, and it's the foundation of Christianity. The foundation of Christianity is about dying with Jesus and waking up a whole new creation. Have you planned your funeral? Have you gone to your funeral? Have you do you wake up every day and realize that I died, but I have a new life in Jesus, and this is how I get to live my life today? The fundamental exchange happens the moment we place our faith in Jesus for salvation. We become a righteous saint through our death, burial, and resurrection. And this is not symbolic. This isn't figurative. It is, as my brothers say, for real, for real. It's not just for real. It's for real, for real. We actually become a child of God. We actually become a child of God. There's much more to the new covenant than escaping the law and being under grace. Don't get me wrong. That's wonderful. Grace isn't a fix for everyone, though. Grace doesn't, grace doesn't work for everybody. It only works for those people who are children of God. It only works for those who put their trust in Jesus Christ who have been changed at the core. I often say when Jesus saved us, he gave us a DNA swap. Took out our old man DNA threw it into the grave, covered it up with dirt, and gave us his brand new spiritual DNA. Brand new. We're a new creation. It's not the old you fixed up. It's a brand new creation altogether. Grace makes things work for us. Our new heart plus the freedom of grace allows God's spirit to be expressed through us. Grace can only work with somebody who's been changed at the core. Put it this way. It's a new engine that only runs on spirit gasoline. How's that? Um, if I pull it up and I get real excited when I'm traveling and I see gas on the sign and it's like 50 cents less, I'm like, thank you, Ohio. Thank you anywhere but Pennsylvania. Amen? Amen. It's basically it. Go anywhere else, and then I pull up, and 
that was the price for flex fuel 88. My car doesn't run on corn, so I can't put it in. So listen, it only works on people. Grace only works on people who have the core Jesus Christ engine in their heart. It doesn't work for other people. Why did we have to die? Why did we have to die? Why do we have to die with Christ? It sounds extreme, but the Bible gives us several good reasons. First, first, we had to die to the law to live a new way. Galatians 2.19, For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. Our old man had a connection with the law. And it, it's, it didn't work either, but it worked a lot better than a new core Jesus Christ. So we had to die so that we could give up the law and now live unto God, live from God. Colossians 2.20 reiterates it. It says this, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, again, the law connected to the world, we used to live underneath the rudiments of this world. Why, as though living the world, are ye subject to ordinances? He's saying you're free. You've been free from the things that this world worships. We're free from the things that this world uh, pays homage to. We're free from that. We don't have to chase the Joneses anymore. We don't have to live to impress everyone around us. We don't have to live to be perfect. God has already made us perfect. See, now we're living underneath a new world. We're living underneath God and his ordinance. Second, we died to the power of sin so that we could have freedom to choose. Romans chapter 6, verse 2, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? We do not have to sin anymore. When sin's presented to us now as a child of God, we have a choice. We can submit to the spirit of God that lives in us, or we can follow after the flesh. We have a choice now. Before we didn't know God, we didn't have a choice. Our only choice was to sin. Now because God lives in us, we have a choice. Romans chapter 6, verse 7, for he that is dead, look at this, is freed from sin. There's no connection anymore. There's no chain connecting you to sin. Jesus Christ cut that chain and severed it. Connected that chain to him. Romans chapter 6, verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey the lust thereof. Don't submit to sin anymore because it doesn't have power over you. Don't let it control you. Don't let it consume you. Don't let it be your master and obey it. Because it's not your lust, it's its lust. And you are no longer sin. So there's two good reasons. The third, we need to die to get a new heart, a new mind, and a new spirit to become a whole new creation. I hope you're encouraged this morning. God has given us the greatest gift on planet Earth, a relationship with God the Father. And he did it through his sacrifice. And God couldn't come and dwell in us unless we were clean because God could not be in the presence of sin. We do sin, but we're not sin anymore for he's forgiven us. First that I often quote to you, every one of us should know it. Great one to memorize. Ezekiel 36, 26. A new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. Not only have you already spiritually died. You've already spiritually had heart surgery. God took out the nasty heart. The one that is in the ground. All your old ways of dealing with hurt. And pain and suffering. And jealousy and hatred and anger. And buried it. 
going to give you a brand new one. You're going to see this world with a godly set of eyes, with a godly spirit, with a godly ears and tongue. And you're going to express me wherever you go now in a whole new way. Isn't that awesome? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. God has put on our hearts his passions and desires. The Bible says that we cannot help but to love the brother. As much as we got on each other's nerves, as weird as we are, and eccentric as we are, we love each other because God's put on our hearts to love each other. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, look at this, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Christmas is coming up. There'll probably be some new stuff underneath the tree for you. Everyone likes new stuff. Smells good, looks good, doesn't have any food stains on it. All the threads are where they're supposed to be. The buttons are all there. Nothing scratched. It doesn't, doesn't have your home smell yet. Everyone has their own home smell. Had to get used to it when I married Ellen. Your family's house smells. She goes, so does yours. <laughs> then we came together, we got our own smell. Many people speak about how. They gave their life to Christ. Now, a few part of it says, well, in 1949, I gave my life to Christ. Actually, he couldn't use our life. It wasn't really worth anything to God. There wasn't anything he could do with our old life. He couldn't, he couldn't reshape it or polish it or buff it out. Best thing I can do for you is bury this. <laughs> That's exactly what he did. And he covered it up. He said, don't dig that up. It's going to sting. How about I give you a brand new one? And that's, that's exactly what this verse says. We need to realize that. We need to realize that the old man is in the ground. And don't go digging him up. Because it stinks. It stinks. He killed it off so that he could give us his life. The old man Adam is dead and in the ground. It's not just positionally. It's not just in God's eyes alone that he sees us dead. We are actually and presently dead to our old selves. And this is our new reality. My old self is dead. I don't have to act that way. I don't have to behave that way. I don't have to use the language and the thought patterns I used to. I'm dead to that. God has given me his life. This is our new reality. Taking the stance that we've only died positionally, I know why theologians like to use that word because it helps to explain our sin struggle. Well, that's why you still struggle with sin, Christian. Because just positionally, in God's eyes, you're okay. But you're really not okay, and you need to get better. Let me give you 12 reasons or 12 things you can do to get better. Then come back next Sunday, I'll give you 12 more. I see why they say positionally, because it's hard to imagine that God has made us whole when we still act rotten sometimes. We still have crazy thoughts going through our, our head. Why we treat people nasty. How can I be a Christian? Oh, that's right. I'm just positionally okay. Then they go on to tell you that you constantly need to die to yourself. Meaning that our death with Christ is progressive and not completely finished. Yet. And the picture is you and I have to grab Jesus, put him back on upon the cross, and nail him one more time so that his blood can come down more and forgive us of the sins we just did. 
Are we positionally righteous or are we really righteous? Is his work on the cross partially finished or is it completely finished? Was his blood semi-pure or was it 100% so pure and powerful that it's done? Thank God that view is not true. We'll talk about that later. Not today, though. But we can't forget the second half of the gospel. Jesus didn't leave us dead in that tomb. He resurrected us with him. And then he ascended to the right hand of God. And where did he seat us? Right next to God. Where does it say that? I mean, wait, we're in heaven? Yep, we're in heaven. But I'm here today, right? Yes, you're here today, but you're also in heaven. What do you mean, brother? Spiritually, you're already there. If we're in Christ, and Christ is seated at the right hand of God, and we're in Christ, we're seated at the right hand of God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, And hath raised us up together and made us to sit together, where? In heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. We are spiritually in heaven. We are seated right next to God, and it's not symbolic, and it's not fake. It's real. And this is the part that Paul wants us to understand, because we've died with Christ, and we're buried with Christ, and the old man is still in the ground, and now we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. These are the implications of the new core life. This is the implications when someone comes to Jesus, becomes a child of God. You are literally in heaven. It's not some place where, it is some place you're going to go, but you're already there right now too. How close am I to Jesus? Great question. Glad you asked. Romans 6, 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we so also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. We're close. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Wait a second. So my human spirit and God's spirit has, that's right, not just hanging out, but literally have fused. I got a big bubble bubble wand when I, I don't know, it was, I think I had one as a kid, but then I got one for my kids, and it's a big, big sliding plastic rod, looks like a baton, and then the baton has some lace material. You can dip this thing in a big bucket, and you can walk through your yard and open the loop up, and a bubble is 10 feet long, and then I can close it off, and this crazy bubble is floating around our yard, and the kids go crazy. I try to tell them, don't pop it. Daddy's going to try something. We, sometimes I can get two bubbles, and then we can get behind one and blow it into the other one. And if it hits it hard enough, the two bubbles become one bubble. There's not even a partition wall between them. That's the picture of what's happened to our spirits with God. Two spirits hit each other and have now become one single spirit. How close am I? How about fused? How about inseparable? How about you can't tell where one begins and the other ends? Amen? That's how close we are. You're next to God. You have the best seat in the house. And yes, it's a spiritual location. It's a spiritual location. But spiritual truth is very real truth. Don't put it in its own category and say, well, that's not real truth. This is truth, what I can see, touch, and feel. Spiritual truth is real truth. And everyone in this world has a spiritual location. We have a spiritual location as children of God, and people that don't know God have a spiritual location. You're either in Adam, the old man, or you're in the second Adam, Jesus Christ. And you can't be in both at the same time. You're in one or the other. You're in darkness or you're in light. 
everybody in the world has a spiritual location. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. And hath raised us up together, man, as to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There's our spiritual location. We're in Christ. We have a heaven viewpoint on things. When we look at this world, we don't have to say, I only got 30 more years to live. Better make a mark. Mm -mm. That's a worldly perspective. We got a heavenly perspective. This is just the beginning. We don't have to get bent out of shape. Something happens. Because we got eternity to ride out. We see things differently, and we should. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3 emanates this. And if ye have been risen with Christ, look what he tells us to do. Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, where we are. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth, for ye are dead. What? Yes, dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. Because of our death, because of our new life in Christ, he's telling us where we should have our focus, where we should have our passions, where we should channel our affections. I've never seen a hearse with a ball hitch on the back pulling a trailer of all the dead person's belongings. Now, some of you are going to go do research. And I found it on Google. It really happened. <laughs> and I believe it. I've heard of rich men being buried in their million dollar car literally they dug a hole in the ground big enough for the car and that that was their casket that was their love you know, they why'd they get the car I don't know but God says our affections are to be on things above why because this earth isn't it this isn't this isn't the end all we got new passions. We're a new creature. We got new motivations, new loves. That's why we set our affections on things, not the things of this world. And we do not have to wait for these truths until we get to heaven. Yeah, when I get to heaven, I'll probably stop caring about this world, and I won't have to be bogged down by making money and making the bills and trying to get my body back in shape so I don't die quicker and avoiding this and avoiding that and pursuing this and not pursuing that. We don't have to wait till we get to heaven to experience the freedom of perspective. We experience it right now. Why? Because you're already in heaven. Don't wait to experience it because you're already there. And this is what Paul's trying to tell us that we're spiritually raised and seated with the king. Heaven is a place we're headed to while at the same time a place we're already seated. God wants us to meditate on this. He wants you and I to think about it when we're driving to and from work. When we're sitting up in the woods freezing, waiting for something brown to walk by. When we're driving the kids to school. When we're taking a shower. When we're laying our head down trying to count sheep. He wants you to meditate on these things. Wow. Died with Christ. I'm a new creation. And this world is not my home. Colossians chapter 3, 2 and 3, just read the last two verses. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Can we just be ourselves? A lot of movements, a lot of TV commercials, just be yourself. Don't try to be somebody else. Just be yourself. And 
I see everyone trying to be like everyone else. It's how it was when I grew up. I mean, I think the trends changed a little bit, but everyone wants to have the same hair, do the same clothes, the same shoes, use the same lingo, drive the same car, cheer for the same team. And as Christians, can we just be ourselves? Is that, is that possible? I don't have to dress like mama and grandma dress when they went to church? Do I have to <clears throat> do I have to marry someone like my dad? Do I have to can we just be ourselves? Too often we Christians assume we're rotten at the core. You know, sinners just like everybody else. When we think this way, we ignore the greatest aspects of the cross, which is the death of ourselves. Yes, Jesus was on the cross, but then you joined him. When we accept the dirty heart theology that we're just this rotten worm, that we're not worthy, and one day we'll... You know, get to be in heaven and be holy. If we accept that we're dirty, we'll always be defeated in our aspirations. Why? Because we're attempting to act like somebody we're not. If we see ourselves as sinful and dirty and rotten and not righteous and clean and close like Jesus says, we are acting like somebody we're not. So we put on our Sunday best, including the smile, get the giant Bible so everyone can see that. Stop cursing before the kid the, before the kids open the car door. So now in the parking lot, I can hear that we're yelling. How you doing, brother? I'm fine, just fine. How you doing? I'm doing fine too. And we're not fine, or are we? See, we're acting like somebody we're not. We're putting on a show. Call it a hypocrite. I like to call it religion. Got a lot of religious people out there. I don't want to be one of them. I just want to be myself. If I'm not having a good day, I want to be able to tell you I'm not having a good day, brother. I'm not having a good day, sister. Pray for me. I don't know what's going on, but I've been thinking about this over and over again. It's driving me crazy. Pray it away for me, please. Something. Help, help. I'm doing fine, just fine. That's religion, folks. You're acting like somebody you aren't. Yet, we have died. We've been raised and seated. We are now clean and close to God the Father. What do we want? But our prayers still go up. Lord, I want to be close to you. Help me get close, Lord. How close are we? And here we are asking God, I want to be close. And God says, you are close. We're one. And I get it, folks. We're, we're growing in our knowledge of God. And we're better every day understanding his great love for us. But never forget the important truth. We are already as close to God as we will ever be. You can't get any closer to being one with him. If you're in Christ, you're spiritually one with Jesus. He's raised us up. Amen? You're seated right next to him. And hath raised us up together. We're seated in heavenly places with him. But there's more. Your human spirit is factually and literally joined with God's Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. He that is joined in the Lord is one Spirit. 
You need to attend your own funeral. You need to see the fact that you have died and that you're buried in the ground. And then you need to meditate on those implications. One spirit with God. That's pretty close. Jesus made us new at the core. I'm not a polished turd. I'm a brand new creation. Amen. His spirit is fused together with our spirit. We're one. Recognize the closeness. Recognize that it's true. Live from this truth. This is a lot better than trying to get close and stay close. This is a lot better than trying to get close and then stay close and maintain that closeness through you, you fill out the list. I am close. God, because I'm close, I can come to you anytime, anywhere about anything. Yes. Yes. Grasp the magnificence of our union with Christ. All our motives will change for everything that we do. We will see that living the Christian life is really just being our true selves. Let's stand and pray this morning. I'll invite Arlene up to close us in. Heavenly Father, I pray that we all will attend.